Okay, there we go. Right, so today uh, the idea is to look at the spatially extended systems, and the way we're going to view them is that there is some lattice, discrete spatial lattice, and then every site of the lattice is some kind of dynamical system. So here I did what might be kind of a complicated case. Just imagine that I had our three first order differential equations for the Rustler, and then there might be some sort of weak coupling to a neighbor of the Rustler. And then one of the, I mean, all sorts of questions here, some sort of foundational. How does, how do these ideas of dynamical system apply to this? What's the state of such a system? Because that's always the first question I give you a new system, like what's the state space? Well here, the implication is this lattice goes on forever. So I know, we know that the dynamical system, the site in this cartoon picture, is a three-dimensional system. Continuous state space, state space is R3. But now, I have potentially an infinite number of these. So the state space is literally infinite dimensional. Which, at first blush, you'd say, you just kind of throw up your hands. Obviously, you're not going to visualize things. You think, but there are actually some ways to start visualizing what's going on in infinite dimensions. So, so today what I'm going to do is give a hint of how some of these ideas of state space, dynamic, invariant sets, uh, even bifurcations, give you some traction on a system like this, even if it's infinite dimensional, and even if the techniques we've used so far, which is you know, letting us stick our heads inside the box and see the state space, where it's not possible, we can still gain some traction on this. Uh, there are more conventional approaches to this area called pattern formation grades. It's a very nice map, like that map for textbooks. Um, this is the lecture today is mostly about kind of the phenomenology of what some of the issues are when you approach an infinite dimensional system from the perspective of dynamical systems, complementary to the more mathematical treatments that analyze its abilities quantitatively. Well, if this is our basic picture, the lattice of dynamical systems, step back a little bit and imagine there are all sorts of different kinds of systems you can invent. So partly you should be thinking, oh, I can just invent all sorts of things myself. So when we're looking at a spatially extended system, we have some kind of lattice. So uh, space is represented somehow. Uh, we have some local state space, and we have choices for that. And then we also have some temporal dynamic. Right? So I'm just today just going to cover cellular automata and nonlinear map lattices because they're a little bit familiar to us. The cellular automaton is characterized as being sort of simplest in this whole tableau of having the state inside be discrete. Right? I think I'm only going to show you binary state, local state cellular automata, but it's still rich enough. The space is a discrete lattice, either, well, again, today I'll probably just show you one dimensional spatial lattice, but you could do two, three, four dimensions if you wanted to. And then time is also discrete, so it's just not doing itself. But these variables I can change. So if you just change the local state to be continuous by putting, say, a discrete time one dimensional map, I still have discrete space lattice and discrete time. Now, so continuous state space, I would say. But I just showed you the, the, the Rustler lattice, if you will. That was continuous time, discrete space, and continuous local state. And there's classes you run into these things called partial differential equations, and those correspond to these tableau to continuous local state, continuous space, and continuous A little bit of the message here is that there are aspects of these more complicated systems, oscillator chains and partial differential equations, that we can begin to understand with these support. Okay, so right before we come to a new topic, we have to, or all of our solutions, give some definitions to get started here, just so we have some vocabulary to talk about. It's a new classic dynamical system. So we're going to have space represented as some lattice, some number of spatial dimensions, call that D. Um, 
So the way we represent that is we have indices, imager indices in some dimensional space. If d was equal to 1, this would just the indices would just be in integers. If d is equal to 2, what this means is the indices for the cells or sites have two integers in them. We um, think of the lattice as being populated having cells at each site, indexed by site index i, and there's some local state. So at site i, there's some state x in some local state space now. So again, uh, there's a Whistler, that was our three, and then we had uh, that cartoon picture i, who has a pair of integers in, in some point in two-dimensional street lines. So this is just sort of look, this is just looking at each site, but now of course the state of the system is the configuration of the entire lattice, the local state of each lattice. So we need to make a distinction here between the local states of the system and the global state, which is the entire spatial configuration. So it's called the global state it is the configuration of all the local states. Well, the notation gets kind of messy here, but anyway, what I mean by x vector, or sometimes I'll use s mole cellular tablet, there's just some big list of the local states for each lattice site. Um, and the state space is going to be, well, we still denoted the same way as we did before for the low dimensional systems, but it's some cross product of the local state space, one for each lattice site. Dot dot here means big. Formally, what we do is we put the lattice as the exponent here to indicate this, this cross product. <clears throat> so again, when I say what's the current state of the spatial system, what I should be saying is what's the current global state or global configuration, and that's specifying the local state of every class. And I'm kind of belaboring an obvious point here, but that shifting from what we think is going on locally to the global is very important because two different of the description of the state. So again, the state of the entire system is a point in this infinite dimensional space. And it's infinite dimensional with this lattice. Obviously, the simulations I'll show you have a finite lattice. Effectively, um, big enough for this. It's as a number of infinite dimensional. Now, what's different from what we've been doing before? Before, with Regular old dynamical systems, we had a state space that well, I mean, had states that behaved in time. So, in a sense, in a formal sense, we had an index that was just time. So, what's different now, we have a space time system, is we have two independent coordinates space and time. Or, you know, space time, if you want to, in the direction of Einstein. And the question is, what can we learn? Well, what I was just talking about is just the basic architecture. We also have to specify some equations of motion, some dynamic for this dynamic system. So usually when we say a system is spatial, there is some notion that of the neighborhoodness of the relationship between them. So what we're going to do here is define a neighborhood to go to eta here. And let's, the, base, the picture of the, of, the, of the dynamic is uh, one that's locally specified. So what we do is we, for each, at each site i, the dynamic looks in some neighborhood where the two nearest neighbors and itself, that is then input to this local function phi that tells this site i what its next value should be at time. So this is the little phi is the local dynamic, and then we say often we study kind of symmetric outside i. So the range of coupling are often called the radius r. So this neighborhood here would have a radius of two. And then this, the site i, as when it's updated, it looks to its two states of its two nearest neighbors on either side, and its own state, and then and there's a deterministic function of that. So, 
So the local dynamic is just the specification of maps and neighborhoods to next to site value. Now, the way the system actually behaves, we imagine that at each lattice site, at each time, that same phi is applied simultaneously. So that defines the global update. That's how the system actually evolves. So, so we have this global dynamic, which is in some sense entailed or induced by the little phi. As the system goes forward in time, it updates the entire configuration of time t to one of time t plus one. The entire configuration here goes and time t goes to another configuration of time t plus one. When we make a notational distinction, we'll talk about this mapping from by infinite configuration to a by infinite configuration with capital phi. That's the global dynamic. So little phi obviously induces capital phi, depends on it, but they're not the same thing. This is a mapping from an infinite dimensional space to an infinite dimensional space. Little phi maps neighborhoods, which is a finite dimensional space, whose dimension depends on R, to next site values. Okay. So if I actually want to write down the equations of motion, then I write down the entire uh, update is I take the current configuration that's input to the global dynamic phi and get Now, at this point, you know, if you, if you just took the abstract dynamical systems view, now I have a state space. I have states, these are points, and they get updated by some function. So we're kind of back to the same setting we had before, except now, when I point at a state in a state space, it actually has an internal structure to it. For example, there's a notion of site i being next to site i minus 1 and some i plus 1. This is an internal structure, which is sort of point of view of a state of dynamical systems doesn't naturally take into account. Right? When we were looking at the Russell and Rand, I wasn't saying, oh, the x variable in three-dimensional state spaces are next to y. It's also coupled to z. There wasn't a notion of this internal structure in the system. That's essentially induced by this underlying spatial lattice. And that's actually how we're going to make progress. In spatial extended system, not all variables talk to all of the variables. They only talk to that's going to lead to certain kinds of organization. Structural so organization so Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just really quick, is, do the dynamics in general depend on time or just the states? Like, so like the local one, does it only depend on the states next to it, or maybe the time as well? Um, in this case, just the states. So, so with this previous state, there's some mapping, which is a function here, that gives us to the state. No, no time to now, the configuration, the actual configuration, I'm going to change in time, but that's just like in the Whistler case, the states were changing over time. But there was no, I wasn't modulating the vector field there, that was kind of the right hand side. And then we have two versions of this. Again, this is just what I've been saying, is just introducing some vocabulary, sort of the art, basic architecture of the spatial design system. And we could have two different versions, one with discrete time map, or we could imagine also having continuous time systems. I'm trying to describe what's common across all those different examples of projects we have. Hey, hey Jim. Yeah. Um, so I've seen in other sort of networks, people deal with um, sort of serial update, where you update one one local state at a time. Do people do that with these uh, cellular automata? And I imagine the dynamics will be different if you do. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. This is just a hint at how we can extend the dynamical systems ideas. There could be other update rules. So what I'm going to talk about today is the simplest one. Mm -hmm. This implied simultaneous update of all the sites at once. Um, for example, you could have what's called asynchronous update. Imagine you had a little radioactive atom at each site, and then the, it did this little decay thing you updated. And then so the sites are kind of firing off and on all over the, the lattice. And that actually, even for the same local function phi, leads to very different behaviors. Um, yeah, so um, you can do it serially. Um, again, that will change the. You know, right, so, so what we're talking about here is the 
that part of the architecture that is the update rule for the lats. As you vary that, you can get different behaviors. So today I'll just show you two classes where it's simultaneous up here. <clears throat> okay, so we have like, I'm arguing that even though this is a spatially extended system in infinite dimension, it's still a dynamical system with a state space and the band. Uh, we have equations of motion written down. You know, at least formally, we start from some initial condition and it traces out a trajectory in the space, now infinite dimension. A lot of the ideas we developed before were looking at the sets and stable and stable manifolds. So the question is how do those tools are they are they even useful? for this infinite dimensional set. The answer is kind of mixed, yes and no, or no, but you have to maybe guess if you work harder. But there's some, some sort of um, um, overall comments on it. So generally, what is dynamical systems that we have to say? This is kind of state space. Um, everything we've worked on so far and introduced have been about low dimensional systems, one dimensional mass, two dimensional mass, three dimensional flows, that sort of thing. Um, and a lot of the argumentation was based on our visually being able to see the structures, like hyperbolic, stable, and stable manifolds around the fixed point. Right, right. dimensions, well, it's not anything obvious. Again, in, in a sense, it's kind of a criticism of this view that we just have a state space where the points. The states are just points. There's, there's no internal structure. Whereas now, well, the states are points in this infinite dimensional space, but actually, if we look inside, that's actually this infinite vector of numbers over the lattice, and there is this notion of continuity and closeness. So, so, so dynamical systems theory proper doesn't immediately address that, kind of throws that information away and perhaps it's just a deficit. What are, what are the invariant sets for these infinite dimensional systems? Are there attractors, fixed points, limit cycles? What, what's going on? I'd right, like to at least see some of these simpler invariant sets there. What, what is stability in the infinite dimensional space? Where before we had there's an attractor, we had this invariant set, in fact, it's something more dynamic. Um, stability meant to take a set larger than that, and then over time it got sucked back onto it. Some question about how we can find that. Now, you can imagine one idea that it says fairly straightforward is if I give you the principle of motion for spatial extent dynamical system minus where the fixed points, you know how to do that. Right? I, put the, I look for all those states such that the left hand, the change is zero. It's a differential equation, right? Where the x dot is. But that's an infinite set of coupled equations that I'm Maybe linearizing around if I want to do Jacobian. So, but there's some cases where you can actually put those things on. So, other ideas. How do we measure instability? Just the, the spatial systems, even though the infinite dimension of that, you attract them into something to as much as stability. Also, bifurcations will be very parameter. What's the spatial analog of the pitch for bifurcation? So, I'll give you some. Um, Demonstration examples of how these ideas map over for dynamical systems, spatial systems. Mm -hmm. so, so, not only are there the, the existing concepts from dynamical systems, but there are new questions. What's the role of neighborliness, the role of spatial structure in the behavior of these systems? How do we deal with these two independent coordinate space and time? And there must be some kind of interaction between things happening in time and how things propagate in space. So uh, there are new questions that didn't work part of the original low dimensional dynamic system. So, so sort of throwing those questions out in the air, I'll give some partial answers by way of examples, focusing on the cellular automata, discrete state, discrete. <clears throat> space, discrete time systems, and the natural axis. One dimensional maps on the discrete time, discrete space, and <laughs> Okay, so first the cellular automata. We have our lattice is discrete space. Um, space is d dimensional here. The examples I showed you mostly for 
this is visualizing them. This is one spatial dimension. So I can show you space versus time. Um, okay. Each side is indexed. I, we have a local state space, I call that S here, it's a symbol, it's an alphabet, now it's discrete, and there'll be, think of those, uh, the alphabet just being K integers. We're just going to do binary today, certainly play around with uh, non elementary cellular telling you that. But instantaneous uh, state or global configuration of cellular telling is just this list of bits at every site in the OS. Um, Maybe we have the same idea. Around every site I in the lattice, there's some R neighbors on either side or in all directions that get included in the update function. It's going to be discrete time, so take this neighborhood of time T, the state of the neighbors around I, and then the state of site I at the next time is just that's function phi of that. So phi here is just, uh, it's, it's just a mapping from bit strings possible neighborhood configurations. Right? If I'm looking at nearest neighbors, there's my value, 0 and 1, my two neighbors, 0 and 1. And these are eight possible neighbors. And then I specify phi as a rule or lookup table that maps length three bit strings to the next value, which is also binary. So I think I'll just, we'll just talk about signals. Phi gets plot in the lattice simultaneously. Jim, can I ask another question? Certainly. Is the difference between the um, uh, the discrete and the continuous case, is this local dynamic rule, basically, that it will be a continuous function for the uh, continuous maps? Um, uh, that's one difference, yeah. Um, it's not the only one, though. Depends on what you make continuous. Uh, mm -hmm. I can... I can um, Let's see. Right. So um, we could imagine. Let's see. So the, in the math classes, I'm going to make the local state a real number of an integral. But I could imagine a state with discrete local state, discrete space, but continuous time. Slightly odd system. Maybe, maybe that's a little more um, like the, uh, the asynchronous model. So you can imagine that there's a little stochastic automaton at every site, and it updates itself based on some distribution over continuous time. Like there is a little automaton, you know, beta decay, and then as soon as the beta decay goes out, then I update. Look at my neighbor and update myself. So that would be uh, one type of. At this point, all things are possible, right? I had <laughs> that table. I listed three characteristics: local state, space. And time, and each one of those can be binary. I only showed you four possibilities, or eight possibilities. Probably all, somewhere in each one of those has some scientific use. Right. Yes, but first things first. Yeah, the simplest things first. Yeah. So there's some connection, there's some communication between the, the nodes and the labs. Right. Which is reflected in the little little phi, right? Yes. Exactly. So, how do you know what the extent of the coupling is? Uh, where where does that kind of get? That's part of the definition of the system. So the eta, right? So so eta depends on phi. So maybe another way to think about this in this in specifying the spatial extended system is there's a notion of neighborhood template, and that could We'll do the simplest case, like just nearest neighbors or next to nearest neighbors in a one-dimensional lattice. But goodness, you could be in a two-dimensional spatial lattice and have some funny neighborhood shape to it if you wanted. And that's actually relevant sometimes for some systems, not being a homogeneous sort of circular or constant radius R neighborhood could actually have a shape here. But but S can have an arbitrary number of dimensions, and you may not necessarily be pulling in all of yeah. all of those. Yeah. Right. right. So. When you say S, I, well, R. I mean, it's discrete. So what do we mean by dimension? In some sense, I could say, oh, I've got three dimensions. In one dimension, it's binary, zero, one. The other dimension is A's and B's. The other dimension is alphas and betas. Mm -hmm. And that might, in, in some particular application setting, you might want to think of that. You might have current and voltage as complementary things, and that would be discretized. 
Here, just the simplest case first to get some sense of what's possible, it's just going to be binary, and, or, or some integer. By the way, I'm presenting it, but I mean, this is something to invent these things and play around with them. We have enough tools to actually make some progress on this. So I will just introduce two of the simpler kinds, but there's a lot to play with. Okay, so right, specify a radius, a neighborhood, um, dictating synchronous updates, and all those things specified, then I end up with the school of the map. It's induced by the, these definitions. It's, it's in a configuration. Okay, a uh, few things here that will affect how we interpret these patterns. We'll get to some examples shortly. <laughs> uh, a lot of definitions here. So first of all, this, this local dynamic, this mapping, really just this lookup table from this binary, it's a local alphabet, binary neighborhood configuration to the next state value. <clears throat> it's a function. I haven't added any noise or probability. That's a place to turn this one. Um, and that, means that this global mapping, big time, is itself a function. And as a result, this global map can be many to one. In fact, it's sort of rare to think of when you specify your local dynamic, how to make five be one to one. So what, what, what does many to one mean? I mean? Two different configurations at time t that map to the same next configuration. Imagine if I mapped everything to zero. <laughs> it's like an all ones or peppering of ones and zeros and all zeros. That's all going to map to all zeros. It's too trivial. But that's an example of an infinite global dynamic. Um, the other consequence of the local dynamic name function is that there is, in the sense we've been using the term, dissipation. There is shrinking of the hypervolume of sets. You don't get the creating thing to do. At best, you can just maintain statement for global state information. So sets cannot grow. They can only shrink. Or in a few very rare cases, you can define, say, local finds that Maintain the number of ones locally, and then those are invertible, and then those will be one for certain. General case, and I'll show you functions. Specifying a phi is a function that just induces shrinking. So, I, you know, maybe that's a simple observation, but again, we need all the help we can get because we're now trying to understand something in different dimensions. So, any basic properties that are really critical. So even if it's in dimensions, I just you know, argue here, these infinite volumes are going to be shrinking. So let's see what that means. So there can be stability. At some point, there will be an analog of the tractor in these cases. So another interesting thing, and this is just a, pretty much a characteristic of the cellular atomic, discrete state, local state. They're called Garden of Eden states, and these are initial configurations that you can never evolve to. The way we say that is that there's no garden of Eden state S. I look at what states could map to it. I look at the inverse of this, we get the formula. And there'll be no such configuration. There's no way to make configurations. So anyway, it's a little puzzling. Um, I already gave an example. The all zero rule. It maps everything to zero. So, so certainly the zero configuration has a lot of predecessors, but the all ones configuration, that system will never evolve to it. We can prepare it as an initial condition, but in one step it goes to all zeros. So this is with a, with a given dynamic. Right. The dynamic is take your neighbor right, right. and right. map the next site value always, independent of what it is, to zero. But a different dynamic couldn't do that. Oh, yes, right. right. Change the right. rule. Absolutely. Change Changing the rule. Yeah. So within a given right. dynamic. Um, and what the, do you mean by the, the, by uh, the identity? Yes. And so you ignore your neighbors and you copy your state value to the next time. 
So you call one configuration, those are only configurations. So every configuration there is its own predecessor. I'm not sure. All fixed points. That's, I'm not sure what you mean by like sets. Sets cannot grow. What sets of? Again, so okay, so so, so think maybe a little bit formally. I argue there's a state space. Yes. Now it's this by infinite, infinite space. Think of what a volume is there. Yeah. What I mean is once you fix a volume, think of think of all of the in this case all the binary configurations that are uh, zeros at even sites and the wild card. So that's an infinite set, mm -hmm. and that, that's a set. And what I mean is, that set, whatever it is, is going to shrink. Sorry. Now there's a bit of an issue about how do I measure infinite volume shrinking? Okay, but at least we can kind of imagine how that happens. So that's what I do that. Okay. You mean, so I'm, I guess I'm also a little confused. So by mm -hmm. set, though, you particularly mean like the set of available states that could be evolved to, or that are any subset of states. Oh, the set of all the different. Types of st okay, now I see what you're saying. All the different possible S's, right. little S's. Right. So what I'm asking you to do here is kind of okay. forget a little bit. It's like half remembering the visualization ideas we had before. Volume shrinking, right? There's a circle around the Lorenz attractor that in four time gets exponentially sucked down onto it. Think about that picture, but it's also a you know, more formal. Yeah. There'll be a little, a few gotchas in this. Little intuitions. Uh, okay. Um, the other thing we can do, because it's discrete local state, discrete amounts of discrete time, is we can ask how many how many different rules are there. So we can calculate the number of neighborhoods. So we have this alphabet of size k into binary, um, and then we have the number of sites in the neighborhood. So if it was just nearest neighbor, a radius one and one spatial dimension. And that would be, uh, well, I'm not specifying here, but temple is. Um, if it's nearest neighbors in uh, one dimension, then it would be in a binary alphabet. We would have two local states and three neighbors. Therefore, the number of neighborhood configurations would be eight three bit binary configurations. So, this would be, so okay, the number of neighborhoods. Nothing else more specific said goes as k to the r to the d. It's very fast. The number of, of, of semitone local rules, which are again these mappings from the neighborhood to next state value, that goes as k to the k to the r to the d. Goes very fast. Um, and as you'll see, we're going to work with what are called the elementary CLs that make this k equal to r to the d, nearest neighbors, one and d. Um, I point this out just because uh, very often, as you go to larger alphabet, larger k, and larger radius, the, the, the number grows just incredibly fast, and it's almost becomes southern tolerant models become less helpful when you have many, many, many local states and a couple of lots of neighbors. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's better off just approximately as a continuum. Okay, so how are we going to think about this? Bit more specific here, set spatial dimension to one. So now we have one dimensional lattice, binary values at each state, and this goes on to infinity. Just to make this sort of graphically clear, the update dynamic is this lookup table I've been talking about, this rule that maps the three values in the neighborhood here to the next site value. So here, zero, zero, one, we go down to five, it's the rule table. That's the neighborhood, and it says, oh, the center site should go to one, and you place one. And then that's done simultaneously across the whole map. Yeah. So the only difference between this and a Turing machine is just the fact that you have a sense of neighborhood. Uh, yeah. There's a, we can come back to this in the spring when we're more directly talking about the relationship between how dynamics produce information and how, those, how that information processing looks like. A kind of computation. But just to mention one little connection there, you can make a phi, although you have to, you know, the easiest construction is to increase the alphabet size to, uh, well, one construction I know is an alphabet of six letters, but there's a phi such that on some set of initial conditions, you can actually implement the universal transition with a set of 
So in some sense, what's going on, if you're not familiar with Turing machines, we'll introduce them later on. This is the tape. And I'm using some of the local state information to say where the read your write head is. And then the, the finite state machine control for the, for the Turing machine is somehow mapped into the state table. And I share kind of dynamic state information in the lookup table and storing some of that local. You can actually get the so, so what, what you would see here is this Turing machine that's operating with sort of an active cycle. And there's around. most of the labs is quite a cycle. There's this one little thing in the round, which actually leads to an interesting connection, first of all, with regular computation theory. But in this setting, you could say, well, gosh, I have all these other sites that are just sitting out there. They're not doing anything. What a waste. Most of these kind of funny systems like the CA examples, they're, they're, all the last sites are doing something. So when we talk about embedding the universe Turing machine, it has a zero density of computation. There's only one site, one lonely site that means that the house is actually doing some information processing as this control little finite head is moving around. Why would you want to build it? If, if I had a parallel system like this with all these independent degrees of freedom, wouldn't it be nice to have them all helping in my computation? So that's the issue of parallel computation. Still, this is so there's some interesting questions that come up. We can try to map in later on. We'll map in some of the additional computation. First, we just have to figure out what can happen. Right? So we're still just dynamic phenomenology. Hey, hey, Jim. Yeah. Um, on that last slide, what is the LUT output bit string? What does that LUT stand for? Uh, sorry. Look up table. That's. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, there's a okay. historical terminology. Uh, the spy. Sometimes we call it the CA rule. Well, it's just, uh, I'll show you in just a second what that means. It, it's just a lookup table. I just specify all the neighborhood configurations and then what the center cell should go to. So, neighborhood, and then site, site value. So, that's just a lookup table. Okay, it was just the acronym. Thing. Yeah. And some people build discrete circuit simulators to do these things. Chips. Um, so now the, the, the elementary CAs here are one dimensional. Um, we're going to have a finite number of cells and wrap them around here on memory conditions. We have binary local states, just nearest neighbor coupling. So that means the neighborhood, each site looks at uh, its neighbor at minus one, and neighbor at plus one. That's the three bit that gets plugged into five, a lookup table, and then we get the next site value. Uh, the number of these, now we can be more explicit. The number of possible uh, CAs is k to the k of the 2r plus 1 if we have a symmetric radius r neighborhood. In the case of the elementary CAs, like I said before, we have eight neighborhoods. There are three bits in the neighborhood, so there are eight possible configurations. And then the number of uh, possible phi's rules is 256. So that's 2 to 2 to 3. I have each out at eight neighborhoods, and I have a choice for each one of eight neighborhoods, whether it's a zero or one for the next site value. Um, now, you can simplify things a little bit. Uh, it's not too hard a calculation. If I don't care whether I represent the on state or off state of each site, the local state, as red or green, black or white, zero or one, then there's kind of a equivalence considered as same. Also, if uh, it doesn't matter if I'm giving how I index from left to right in site zero to site n, or vice versa. So under those two exchanges, there are only really only 88 different equivalence classes, distinct behaviors. So I can go down 256 to 88. And these are finite enough numbers. People, for years, did exhaustive studies of all possible elementary cellular problems. So one quick thing that's kind of handy, this is a notation introduced by Stephen Wolfram, we can look at, or given cellular automata local rules mapping from neighborhood to next site value, well, we have a canonical, what's the graphic order that you would choose for the neighborhood configurations. And then we read off the output bits in just that same order, and then turn that into an integer. So this is, so this is the least significant bit, most significant bit, so the one's bit, the two's bit, four's bit, eight's 16 bits. So two plus 16 is 18. So we call that lookup table elementary cell automaton 18. 
So I slip into this all the time. Those of us who say these things, they say, oh, Rule 54 and Rule 110 and so on. That's what we're referring to. It's this specification of the output that's in the lookup table that we converted to an entry, just a nice short one. And like I hinted at before, as soon as we get to alphabets of size 4, 5, and 6, and next to nearest neighbors, this number is still is useless. But at least for the elementary CX. If you ever go to a cellular talent conference, you'll hear things like have the favorite. Studying elementary CA 22. It's session on what is rule 22. Okay, so how are we going to look at this? So, one of the key uh, ways of visualizing how the cell atomic behave is in terms of a space time diagram. So, I start off at time zero, I specify some initial configuration here, just some arbitrary bit string, zeros and ones, and then I just plot the successive configurations of the This happens to be Rule 18, but I'll talk about it a little more. And then the other thing I'll do is um, show you the space-time diagrams where the underlying lattice is not infinite, but that periodic. So here is a 50-site lattice. Site 49 is the neighbor of site 0. So in fact, mathematically, you should think of this as a cylinder. Now, now, kind of a tour of what could happen. Right? So we have this space, potentially 256 different dynamics, different rules. I just argued that really just 88 ones could be different. Um, we just do a survey of what are the interesting behaviors over this elementary, this classic elementary CX. So I'll do this in kind of in, in mirroring the order that we introduced dynamic systems. So. Uh, Rule 8, so again, I said rule 8, this is a binary thing, so you should think of the 8 output bits. That means the third bit is turned on, just one, one on bit. Well, basically, whatever initial configuration I started with, this thing, in a few steps, goes to all zeros. So you can play this with the southern tongue, the lab, the rule 8. Try different initial configurations, there's a way there. Having a generate random initial conditions of the us. And what you'll see is for rule eight, pretty much everything goes to zeros. So you think, well, first of all, what's our dynamical system to Zero seems to be a fixed point. Obviously, down here, time 13, zero goes to zero. Just almost, it's a visual proof that zero is the invariant set, it's a fixed point. And if you try probing it with different initial conditions and see that they all come back, that means there's some neighborhood round zero star, all zero configuration, right? flipping bits, it gets sucked back onto it. Okay, so there's some hint that, although this could be an infinite dimensional system, that zero star is an invariant set, it's a fixed point, and it's a tracking fixed point. Now the fun starts. So here are three different example CAs. This is rule 204, rule 140, and rule 79. Uh, I think they're all starting in the same initial configuration. Here it is. Uh, what happens here? Well, basically every bit. It starts off at 1, it stays at 1, starts off at 0. In fact, if you go look up rule 204 and you lay out the lookup table, what you see is that it's just copying the center bit in the three bit configuration, which is just, so it's just the identity. Fixed point. Like every configuration is a fixed point. And none of them are stable. Uh, now rule 140 here. Um, what you see is, well, how to describe this. We'll talk a little bit later on about describe these uh, space-time patterns. But one of the things you notice is that uh, if there's a one anywhere, it's bounded by zeros. So the texture is here basically columns of ones that are separated by some number of zeros. In other words, I don't find two ones together at all. There's some kind of interdition there. Um, so there is actually kind of a regularity that we can describe 
And once you describe this regularity, it's basically that I've had columns of ones next to zeros. Talk about how to use a common to represent binary sense and string sets like that. You can show that that set is actually invariant. And it's also stable. You can see the stability up here just a little bit. Again, you can play with this with the, with the, with the Sage lab. And sort of see, starting with different initial configuration, you see the same thing. You see, there's, wherever there's a one, it contracts down to a single one. Then. So there's kind of a stability. I can take this configuration and flip some ones around here, and those are all going to be shrunk back down to these columns of ones. So there is a vicinity around this collection, within the collection. Um, so randomly placed vertical with one black columns um, that specifically will come back into it. So there's a sense of again, fixed point kind of trivial. Everything's fixed point. Here, okay, this actually has some basis of attraction around it. Uh, and it's a fixed point and stable. Uh, rule 79 is actually another kind of example of this, except maybe a little one is a little harder pressed to sort of see what the the regularities here. Here I can have columns of ones with one or with two. And then those are separated by isolated zeros. That's it. So there's actually a way that we can we'll actually learn the sort of tunnel theoretic description of these of the spatial structure we have. And you can show that this not only is an invariant set, but that uh, LNG CA uh, it's also stable. So I'm kind of anticipating a little bit uh, some other tools we're going to bring in. But uh, here, so this, the first cut is we do have fixed points. It's what they look like. The same pattern comes back to itself after time. Um, and uh, by experimenting with these particular cases, you can convince yourself that there is a type of attraction you're going to that has uh, sort of regularity in the spatial structure and that is stable. Okay. Dynamically, these are kind of true. As soon as, it, as, soon as, it, as this relaxation period ends, it just copies what it's going on. So it's kind of, as I get down to a fixed spatial pattern, it's essentially the identity. Not very interesting, especially for a spatial system, but there are other examples where we have things moving around in space and time. Okay, so here's rule 99, rule 51, and rule 35. Now, what do we see here? Again, you can go play with this rule. So, uh, starting from different initial configurations, at least at long times, we get this homogeneous checkerboard. So, the configurations are not fixed points, right? They're now limit cycles, period two limit cycles. So, here, say, even time, we have one zero, one zero, the next time, zero, one zero. So, we get this checkerboard. Pretty regular spatial structure that's easy to describe, right? regular temporal. Um, same thing down here, rule 51. <sighs> Maybe a little more complicated. Why? Well, because I've seen these bands of different sizes here. I don't know what band we saw before. But within the bands, things are obviously period two. So here, I have all zeros, some small configuration, all zeros, one, all of them are zeros, so that's periodic. Um, there's another little region over here that Kind of like this, like the whole piece of this. Um, it's alternating zeros and ones spatially, and then that flips. So it's also a period two here, but it has a different spatial structure. And you can sort of see it pretty much just as soon as we uh, it settles in, it just, it's quite predictable. So not only do we have local periodicity, the local limit cycle, we have kind of local configuration regions. So periodic sequences of spatial configurations, and then there's rule 35, which is, now you see it's actually just propagating off to the right here, and again there are these regions of kind of synchronized oscillation, and then exactly out of phase, spatial shift. It's a relaxation period here, things mapping down. Again, maybe it's a little bit more obvious here. We might have some arbitrary configurations. We see these sort of little um, white and colored particles, if you will. We will do that later on. So there's a white particle hits a black particle, they annihilate, and then it's left over this homogeneous texture region. So there's some initial period of time 
in this artificial universe. You know, it, it has its own first three minutes. You put in these random initial hot configurations, and it's cooling off and simplifying things. And that's also kind of a hint that this limit cycle here actually can be stable. Many, many initial conditions are mapping down to this one kind of one kind of series of states. So there might be a vicinity around this that's going to suck down onto it. So again, that's again why the library point about this dissipation, because there's a little function that that effect is contraction. I can put in any initial frame string, and then this just goes to checkable. So some shrinking in state space and simplifying spatial. So rule 99, I can see that that's uh, a limit cycle because, it, and, and it's stable because you perturb it, it's going to go back to what it was. Mm -hmm. Rule 51, though, I, I'm not sure I can intuitively see that that is stable because if you perturb that, it seems like you're going to get a different uh, pattern going forward. Right. So A, you'll do that with the lab. <laughs> and actually, rule 51 is actually... It's the identity. Okay, well, let me push ahead. There's more to it. And I'm kind of stepping, I'm thinking out in the space of 256 rules, some, some interesting things that can be laid out in the classification scheme that we talked about before. Um, so now here is rule 109. At some point, these rules just, just play around with them. This is a kind of a, a some sort of mixture of local fixed points down here, these little columns of zeros, and then uh, they kind of form uh, local boundary conditions to different kinds of periodic patterns. So here, okay, it's, it's a kind of checkerboard with the whites always bounded by zero. The whites always bounded by black, sorry. Um, got a regular pattern here. See, there's this little kind of house-like thing going on here. Maybe it gets a little wider if I move the columns apart. But then I can have them a little bit out of phase, and then the, this one's some bizarre mixture of like it's upside down, you small U's and individual dots. So. Now this will repeat. I mean, I can take some segment of this, and that takes a little longer to figure out what the period is. Or well, maybe a period. You can pick some configuration here, and then you look forward in time until it repeats. As soon as it repeats, of course, then it'll exactly repeat again. But now this is a complicated spatial pattern, so doing, the visually doing match is harder. You can write a program to do that, which of course I can tell you what the minimal period is. So not as uh, simple as the, the other limit cycles. There's some kind of diversity, and, and, and a little bit you can almost analyze this in terms of, well, if I have a region here that's bounded by these white columns, and the fixed boundary conditions, not in some sense, the information flowing across or curvature not coming across that, I could just Sort of count up the cycle length here and the cycle length here, and then the overall period would be some product of those cycles. It would be a little more analysis. I mean, this is also kind of thing. What's going on here? It's a spatial extended system. So I start with some random initial configuration. Turn up the sort of uh, one region. The sites start to talk to each other. Maybe they kind of synchronize, or even kind of generally synchronize. And over here, they start to synchronize. But as time goes on, they don't agree about what synchronization is, and then we get some region of disagreement. So, so locally what's going on is a type of local space contraction, or synchronization, simplification. But globally, those regions can get attracted to simple fixed points, limit cycles, independent of others. But then the whole lattice spatial structure is a, some sort of product or composition of those things. So there's a kind of modularity here, which is part of the system being spatial. Because each site is only talking to its neighbors, if I perturb a site, that information can propagate at most one site per time step. So we say the speed of light is one. It's determined by the radius. When you have a finite speed of light, perturbations can propagate at only finite speed. That means distant regions that haven't communicated yet can sort of be doing independent behaviors. So finally, there's enough time for them to communicate, and then they just disagree. So they could be a fixed point here, and a three, two minute cycle here, and there'll be a boundary disagreement. So it's a little more challenging in this case to, to imagine that's, what's going on, but you can't say sometimes. Okay, so you might think of this a little bit crudely like the analog of 
quasi-periodic behavior. Remember, quasi-periodic behavior against torus attractors and these relatively irrationally related frequencies, different kinds of oscillations, because they weren't exactly phase locking, we kind of filled out this larger set. A little bit of an analogy here. So we had limit cycles, these are maybe some kind of very discrete types to handle quasi periodic behavior. And of course, chaos. Well, that's kind of an issue. What do we even mean by chaos? Remember our basic properties. So maybe the first pattern is it just looks complicated. Complicated orbits. So here's this is rule 90, rule 18, as I showed you, okay, and rule 23. And these are some of some of our, our favorite complicated series to look at. Um, turns out, and this is partly a product of my having stared at these space-time diagrams for far too long. Despite the sort of complications you see, this kind of texture, uh, the texture, there's actually quite a bit of structure in both of these diagrams. But we're going to have to wait a so basically spring to figure out how to describe what that is. Um, I mean, there, there, there are some patterns you see them all. So uh, let's look at rule 18. What is big white triangle here? So what's going on there? You do a local analysis. If you have the, the lookup table, rule 18. If you remember, it's simple. All the neighborhoods, the three good neighborhoods, they all map to zero, except for two neighborhoods. So zero, zero, one, that maps to one, and one, zero, zero maps to one. So what happens is there are a bunch of local neighborhoods that all map to zeros here, simultaneously. That depends how wide this film is. And then we look at the, the, the one bits sort of coming into the white region, the all the zero star region. That's the activation of the rule 001 next to 1. 001, and then I map the center cell to 1 now, and that propagates a bit in. And then the same thing for the other uh, uh, local table entry 100 that propagates. So, really, King is actually pretty easy to describe at first glance for white triangles. It's like there's a saturation dynamic, everything resets to 0, and you can convince yourself that zero star, zeros, is a fixed point. So any region of zeros maps to zero. And then one one is propagated. That explains all of that. I'm not sorry. But some statistics. Um, there's actually there's a lot more structure going on. So even this bit of the white triangle thing is going to reset information propagating. We think here roughly the same argument works. It turns out the white triangles are the least interesting thing in the space time diagram. So they're actually little particle things moving through all of this, different structures. So we won't be able to do a complete analysis of the way we have some more tools. They're actually quite structured. So you know, it's actually the density of zeros and ones is slightly different. It's fine. Okay, so this it visually just complicated. That's the closest uh, parallel with what we meant before when we gave the definition of the chaotic attractor. Right. Attracting the right set that has positive, at least one positive outlaw exponent, where this, this entropy rate is positive. So, what, what would be the analog of a layout on an exponent? So, what you can do, so we have the same three cellular automata. Remember how we did the dot spreading, or the way we thought about layout on an exponent? I had a reference trajectory, and then I just perturbed, a little epsilon perturbation, and then I tracked two trajectories and looked at how that initial small separation grew exponentially, and that exponential rate of growth was the layout on an exponent. Okay, so. Why not do that construction here? It's a little tricky, right? Because now we're in infinite dimensions, but that shouldn't stop us. I have a point. Okay. Let's say the all zero configuration. And then what I'm going to do is just flip one bit. And that's the smallest difference I can make. And then I'm going to plot the trajectory, which is the difference, the, the difference vector. So I propagate zero star forward. I propagate zero star with the one bit forward, and I look at the difference 
So that's, that's what I'm plotting here. And what we see is that, in fact, even one small, for Rule 90, one little bit clip actually had, causes this cascade of difference that could propagate out in space. So, in fact, there is separation between these two trajectories. Same thing for Rule 18, same thing for Rule 22. So, we can look at the spreading rates. Probably better to call them spreading rates, not the alpha of exponents, but construction is motivated by the previous idea. So, the number of different bits. And we can use the number of different bits between zero star and positive one to measure distance of the infinite dimensional space. Rows and rows and rows. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like it really depends on your base initial condition that you're comparing to. What? Um, is that a problem? I mean, is that, you'd have to have a, quite a description for your spreading. Well, but that was also true with the Alpha X points, right? So, it's one thing to make the Try to measure the alpha exponent for the Whistler attractor. And I have to start with points on the attractor and look at the little frame that gets carried along and how those basis vectors are stretched and trying to get the whole spectrum. But I could have started you know, two miles away in, the, in another attractor. Same thing here, it's true. Yeah. But there may be a dependence of spreading rates on what the initial two configurations are, where they are in the state. Yes. In fact, we already argued like, for the identity. These spatial systems have an infinite number of fixed points. So there could be many, many, many bases of attraction here. That infinite number is kind of the the case. So again, we can a little bit kind of get our head around that. But uh, it's not as visually apparent compared to the differential equation case we're looking at. Okay, so so okay, so this is some you know, first cut of what we might mean by a spatial extended system being chaotic. That small variations that amplify, in this case, propagate in space and time. You can try this experiment for the others. I probably should have figures for this, but for the, for the periodic um, the limit cycles and fixed points I talked about, you do that, and indeed, there's no spread. So you can try that with the most of just kind of talking about the initial conditions. Um, now the other thing that happens um, with these uh, elementary cellular automata and spatially extended systems generally is that they, they don't have this first three minutes of cooling down and simplifying to some kind of attractive or variant set. They've been very, very, very long transits. Um, so this is rule 54 from time zero, starting from some arbitrary initial bit string, going 100 steps, and then jumping ahead, iterating a bunch, and then showing you what it looks like going from step 2574 to step 2673, much later. So initially, again, actually squinting your eyes, that video actually helps with this. There's, it's a more complicated early phase, so it is like, like it's cooling this first three minutes of simplifying things down here. You find these more homogeneous regions of texture, these big white triangles sort of disappear, and then long times what you tend to see are these columns of large and also sometimes small white triangles. Those are simplified down. And then I can tell I'm giving you a big enough swap of time here that in fact this is a Temporally periodic pattern, it's a little bit cycle. So it's just kind of looking. By changing the initial condition, one of the things that can happen is that these might occur over here, or I might have three of these here, one here, and so um, it would be very complicated based on some attraction to these little cycles here. Um, so these long trains are actually quite common. Um, probably the most uh, famous elementary. Selling the Tonaton is this one. It's rule 110. Like Rule 54, it has this very long period. In fact, this is quite extended over 100 times that's not even clear. It's really settling down to a complicated background the texture here. Um, but if I jump ahead 600 steps, I end up seeing that there is some sort of background regularity 
can see this is actually kind of a tiling, periodic tiling of space and time. Texture right here. I can kind of count a little bit. It's uh, period four in time and period seven in space. There's a little tile. Uh, then we have this funny thing. We get obviously a different texture. So one of the ways that, that you can't help but look at these space-type diagrams from some of the comma, partly just the way we see things, we want to think about these background textures and kind of like the vacuum states. These are sort of harbingers of periodic orbits. Um, but then there are boundaries between these that we look like um, particles. So the reason Rule 110 is famous is that someone showed that there are sets of initial conditions that you can choose such that you can encode any problem and do any computation. So in other words, you can embed, or if it's a time evolution of Rule 110 over these special program initial conditions is equivalent to a universal language. Again, it's not very efficient because most of the lattice is quite essent, but the ways of using these particles to store and process information. I'm jumping ahead a little bit to some of the things we call the spring, but um, um, these particles store information in their temporal phase, and then they can communicate that across space. You implement logic in a sense by colliding different kinds of particles together, alpha particle and beta particle store different kinds of information about some previous uh, region, some previous time, previous region, or previous time, they come together, they form essentially logic gates. So that's how the construction right? turns rule 110 into a universal term machine over a very particular set of initial conditions. But rule 110 has rich enough pattern forming properties, rich enough background textures, so-called domains and particles, that you can use a subset of those to implement kind of spatial logic. Um, we can also look at there, are they chaotic? Well, okay, what we have now so far is just a spreading rate measure. And so I guess go back to Rule 54, although it mostly settled down to a regular background texture with a few of those fat vertical particles that are just sitting still Perturbations do propagate in space, just one bit flip. And rule 110 is actually really <coughs> peculiar. Perturbations, it's one little bit flip, only propagates to the left. There happen to be very useful construction after construction. Rule 110 being the most. Uh, let me just finish up with um, just some demonstrations that maybe uh, survey a little more broadly what can happen with the LNF receivers. Just a, it's mostly kind of a show and tell day for these different types of spatial systems. Um, hopefully, the argument is at least a little bit compelling that some of the ideas in the general dynamics of systems can be brought uh, we'll have We won't be able to tie that story up until the spring. Cellular automaton class models. So we just talked about the deterministic cellular automaton. We also do stochastic cellular automaton, where the local rule table is probabilistic conditional distribution. Um, another class of things I call cellular transducers. And that is to model the effect of not being able to see the internal states. So I might have rule 18 with the local states being zeros and ones, it's propagating the law. But I might have a a measuring instrument that is a different function of the local neighborhood that we cite that returns A's and B's. So this 
a direct analog of how they're talking about hidden dynamic systems, the same type of model that, that, that generalization of some of the about hidden spatial systems. I'll just show you some of these deterministic series that we're talking about. Um, right, so I chose rule 18, class of 100, um, and different update methods. So I chose synchronous, and then I'll display 100 time steps. Um, it's asking for the kind of boundary condition, so I'll just use periodic boundary conditions. So it ends kind of with uh, some neighbors, and I'll just fill it with a bunch of band bits. Then, that's the first time I do this, it shows up over here. So here, just. Yeah. And we just kind of keep simulating here. I'm just stepping down other iterations at a time and well, pretty much got the same texture. Whatever it is, kind of stable, persistent anyway. Um, perhaps we a little more interesting what we can do here is uh, going to set up uh, a random sample of the look of tables. I can display a mosaic of space time diagrams to give it a sense of the possible textures and behaviors. Uh, okay, so here we go. Okay. So when I'm showing, but it's doing it's just randomly in the space of the nearest neighbor elementary CAs, the 256 rules it's picking out for 1619. Uh, rule 56, rule 242, rule 202. <coughs> and one of the questions is, is there something typical about these? Are there just a few kinds of space-time paths that they produce? So this is a quick way of doing this. Obviously, these are really simple. So right, cellular time part, like these simple spatial extent systems are really efficient to calculate. So let's go up using if you're interested in pattern formation, start studying these first. Uh, rule 235, that looks like rule 8, I showed you maps to not all <laughs> zeros, but all ones. That's fun to bring that very quickly. Uh, rule 70 has a kind of columnar thing with depending upon the widths of the columns, you can have different uh, locally periodic behaviors. Uh, six columns at once, basically identity map after it settles down. Um, we have propagating to the right. Six and two point two. Uh, rule one ninety three. I actually happen to know that one. It actually it was um, mapped into rule one ten, but it's just the opposite. It's zeros are ones, ones are zeros. So we have black triangles, not white ones. Uh, so we can just kind of do another sample. Um, rule 126 is sort of like rule 22. Uh, what else is going on here? You know, actually, after a while, the onset of boredom is a good thing here. You know, keep looking, you keep looking, you kind of go, ah, you know, it's maybe six or eight or ten things going Get some, you know, some optimism that you can actually describe the space of what these nearest neighbor biology systems are doing. Roughly speaking, there are these uh, sort of regions of homogeneous background, and these sort of uh, walls between them. So we call these domains, borrowing the terminology from solid state physics, domains and, and particles, or domain walls. So you can decompose the uh, the cellular automata patterns into, oh, well, I just have one domain here, that's zero star. Then I have these single bit width walls. Um, same thing down here. Um, it's a little harder to look at the, the chaotic rules like this and this guy. Um, see if there's a background texture. So what we do is we have some automated methods we make for machines to look for these things. These background textures look very sets. But after a while, you know, again, this is a local period two domain with particles that are going to the left. Uh, rule 181, so it looks like rule 86, but now I also take this and look at the right shift on things. So you just keep looking around, it doesn't end up being 
the diversity doesn't keep increasing. There really are just a finite number of patterns that these subatomic can generate. Maybe uh, more interesting would be let's go to next to nearest neighbor. So now each site is going to look at its neighbors and then their neighbors. So that's a five bit neighborhood. Maybe there's something new going on. Uh, rule is two now, not one. And again, look at the rule number there. I mean, the range of rules that goes up to 21 billion. I don't remember the number at this point. Um, I'll just pick one because it doesn't matter. And then, uh, let's see, do I have to pick it? Yeah, there we go. Again, <laughs> the rule number is. So, so many of these, just binary next to nearest neighbor, that we don't know them by name anymore. So, so ignore that. Uh, so what's going on here? Um, it's a little bit coarse grained, so there's some, obviously something that's been lost here. But um, well, you do see, you know, regions temporally period two bounded by these walls. Um, there's some particles kind of propagating here. This one looks sort of interesting. Um, it's kind of Homogeneous textures, maybe chaotic means here. This one looks a little bit like a mixture of some areas where it might be locally unstable, chaotic in sense of spreading, but then also other regions here. It's two zeros, two ones, two zeros. That could be invariant. This thing looks familiar from before, the radius one. And again, yeah. Uh, you know, this is also similar. Do you see it again here? Sorry, I hit the button. Yeah, I mean, the right button one. The right button. Yeah. So it's it reaches to the right. So it's kind of steady. Well, this uh, actually, um, that, that, that is a bug in my, my next Windows code. It should finish drawing that out. That gives us some kind of room to put this one down here. <laughs> so it's a bug. I don't like that so much. Fix the drivers, yeah, it should synchronize. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, right. So yeah, maybe there are more examples. Okay, so this one's like probably I had sort of chaotic domain here, propagating along. Somehow it hits something and then just fixes it in space. Everything else is all pretty much uh, a fixed point through a fixed point. So maybe there are some good things here with radius two. Turns out this texture background, this domain and particle, or domain wall analysis, actually explains a lot of this. It just turns out with next to the nearest neighbor or more states per site, it's a little harder visually to see the textures, which is where some of the automated proof and search methods get come up with better than the visual. But it's not radically different than the kind of thing you see. The other direction to go is to add more um, states, local states. Do it in color, that's what they might try. Do it in general wallpaper. So, okay, well, let's uh, finish up there. And, uh, so, I, we only talked about the cellular atomic today, so uh, next Tuesday I'll talk about the map lattices where we put, instead of this little finite state machine in every site that looks at its binary neighbors, we'll put a logistic map and we'll have kind of a few some couple. So the state space then will be now continuous. So actually some more geometric notions we can bring back. Right? This is so you're talking about a state space is very discretized. Try to think about the geometry of the space so discrete. Okay. Answer questions.